that made me worse. Oh, that's okay. I did it. Look at that. Genius. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Clark. Cool. Um, thanks, guys. Um, so, um, like, like you already know, my name's Heather O'Brien, um, and I, I happen to be um, Tally's sister-in-law. Uh, so, so we we reached an agreement, and uh, and I made a PowerPoint presentation, which we're gonna. I'm actually gonna give in several places. So, this is some a mix of some old and some new info. Um, so. Um, some of you guys, you'll be the first ones laying eyes on some of this stuff. So um, you'll have to let me know if it's understandable. If you have questions, don't hesitate to just ask me. You don't have to wait till the end or anything like that. I'm I'm not uh, picky about that kind of stuff. So um, is that going to work? It's misbehaving. I'm going to use arrows. Maybe. Okay. I did. <laughs> it won't go anywhere now. The arrow keys aren't going either. My technology curse has followed me here. Oh. All right. All right, you're good. <laughs> Watch, I'll try it and it won't work. Okay, cool. <laughs> Will this one work now? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, and pointer, okay, great. So uh, I, I always feel like I already heard, why are we, why are we talking about wolverines and not birds? I swear I'm a bird nerd, uh, and I will I will prove it in these first couple of slides. So, um, like you already know, I, I got my undergrad degree, and I, I'm born and raised uh, in Wisconsin, and and moved out here um, for my career. But when I first got started, all of my background was in birds. So um, I did a little bit of work with red winged blackbirds, which I know is my sister in law's favorite bird. <laughs> I love them; they have great behavior, um, and and this was a parental behavior study um, with, um, you can see this picture over here, of uh, there's one odd odd man out egg in there from cowbirds. So it was a cowbird parasitism study. Uh, and then after that, I worked for the state um, wildlife agency, the Department of Natural Resources in Wisconsin, for quite a while working on loons, um, which are, um, if you've seen my house or my office, you'll know is like my favorite species. I've got, I've got them everywhere. I've got one permanently etched on my skin. Uh, and I, I also did some work with some other species uh, with uh, goshawk surveys, uh, with black terns, which were really cool to work with. And also um, very pesky uh, in the same fashion that, that blackbirds are. They'll, um, they'll swoop down on you. They'll defecate on you, which is really fun. Um, and they live in very swampy places that are tough to tough to work in. But so that's where I got my start. Um, and then after that, went to grad school at, in Milwaukee and worked, um, like you already heard, on on deer and studying uh, when, when there's too many high density of, of deer on some state natural areas, which are intended to protect plant communities. They happen to eat the plants that you're trying to protect. So um, so for my graduate research, I, I came up with an efficient, cheap, easy way for those state natural areas to estimate how dense their deer population was, and then did some exclosure studies on a couple of the rare plant species that you see up there. This is a bog plant called leatherleaf, and I think a lot of people will recognize that is a, a forest floor early spring emergent called trillium. Um, both very showy and very delicious. So um, we got eaten frequently by white-tailed deer, and it, it basically helped them justify having a management program to control deer on those two state natural areas. So after I did that, I immediately moved out. These are some of the places in Wisconsin that I worked before I left. And then ever since then, I've worked for um, the Wyoming Game and Fish Department in a couple of different capacities. So for the first 16 years of my career, I was um, a big game and uh, like a game species biologist with that focus um, in uh, the northeastern part of the state around the town of Gillette and then also um, around the city of Casper, which is where I live now with my husband who's having to sit through this, even though he also works for the department and hears me talk all the time. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> but. Uh, Got to work on all kinds of cool species, um, not just birds. So um, after after that deer grad school experience, um, I I moved out of just working on birds and started working on all of these other species and and got lots of exposure to a lot of cool um, cool experiences. And then uh, for the last year and a half, I've been our statewide non-game. Um, so anything that doesn't have 
um, like a hunting license associated with it, uh, species for the entire state. So we have one bird biologist for non-game species in the state of Wyoming and one non-game for uh, one non-game mammal biologist in the state, which is me. So um, this is just a sample of some of the species that we have um, focused on in, in recent years. Some of them are um, threatened and endangered species, uh, but I, I feel like this audience is probably a little different than some audiences that I speak to who want to know like why why does anyone bother with uh, like with doing research or management on on non-game species um, because most most state agencies focus on those animals that you can hunt you can harvest you can um, you know you can um, eat uh, whatever so um, so why non-game? Um, I, I figured I'd put a little spiel in here before we launch into wolverines in particular, but um, it's part of our state statute that our agency manage all wildlife species in the state. And that's true for CPW as well here in Colorado. Um, so another reason to focus on non-game species is they're, they're more likely to be listed as threatened or endangered. Um, so anytime um, a species becomes uh, like listed uh, by the Fish and Wildlife Service, that uh, like triggers a whole bunch of management actions that need to take place, um, cooperating with federal agencies. The state agencies usually take on a lot of the groundwork um, to try to recover those species. So because non-game species are kind of more frequently end up uh, on the endangered species list, that's another reason to, to stay focused on them, to try to prevent that from happening and catch it before that becomes necessary. Um, Non-game species also can be like an umbrella species, an indicator species for entire ecosystems. So by managing one of those species, you can kind of um, like blanket uh, uh, cover management for an entire ecosystem or plant community and, and the associated habitats for that species. And prairie dogs are a great example of that. They're not typically like a threatened species, but they create their own environment. Um, and there are a lot of um, threatened or sensitive species that I think a lot of you can think of that are associated with prairie dog colonies, you know, like burrowing owls, ferruginous hawks, um, uh, swift fox, things like that. So by, by paying attention to those umbrella species, you can kind of manage all of those things. Uh, and, and of course, non-game species are numerous and they they represent a tremendous diversity and wildlife heritage that we want to maintain. So in Wyoming, we have, like I said, I have statewide responsibility and that includes 83 different non-game mammals. So that's a lot for one person and associated, um, you know, contract employees and summer technicians and stuff like that to cover. So we focus on a lot of those threatened and endangered species or those um umbrella species. Um, as they come up and that kind of shifts around over time. Some of them stay constant and some of them change from year to year. Um, but the way that we uh, approach um, maintaining and managing those species is by mainly doing inventories and, and keeping track of their distribution, their ranges and monitoring trends over time. So, so we may not study one particular species every single year, but we might cycle back to it to get trend data over time to see, is that population growing? Is it shrinking? What are the threats or the habitat changes that are causing those, um, those changes in the distribution of that species? And, and are they things that we need to be concerned about um, and take management action over? Um, so uh, on top of that, uh, we do a lot of Again, like with threatened and endangered species that are listed by the Fish and Wildlife Service, we participate in recovery planning for those species. So uh, black footed ferrets um, is a big one in the state that, that we do um, do work on every year. Um, Prebles, meadow jumping mice. I don't know if anyone's heard of that species. Very, um, very uh, high profile on the front range because the majority of Preble's populations are right here on the front range in Falcon. There's a, a, a population, there's Chico, and we kind of manage them by watersheds and drainages. And they, they spread up into Wyoming. So we participate with Colorado and the Fish and Wildlife Service in recovery planning for, for Preble's. Um, it's a lot of multi-agency collaboration, as you've heard already come out of my mouth, the, the names of other agencies and um, other state wildlife agencies. And then we also, for species that maybe we don't have time or funding to focus on, we'll partner with research entities, academia, um, 
graduate students that have an interest in a certain non-game species and kind of collaborate with them and coach them through um, answering some of the questions that maybe our agency would like to see answered and have them include that in their research and study. So our current focal species that, uh, that we're uh, working on right now in my section are listed here. And you've already heard me mention a few of them. Bats are becoming a huge deal because of like nose syndrome and, and the loss of populations. Um, there's currently, uh, at least in Wyoming, one species that is, about, uh, is uh, listed as endangered in the northeastern part of the state. And we've got three basically in the hopper that the service is um, waiting to announce that are going to be either be listed as threatened or endangered. So we'll start doing that recovery work um, on those species and trying to bolster their populations, protect their habitats and things like that. Um, Prebles I already mentioned, prairie dogs I mentioned. We just finished a, a pika study and you'll notice there's, there's a little bit of commonality between pika and the species we're gonna talk about today related to climate change. Those are two high alpine species that are reliant for some part of their life history on snowpack and, and consistent snow cover. Um, and because of that, those are species that we have interest in. They've been petitioned for listing um, uh, under the ESA more than once. So, so we do monitoring on both of those species. And then swift fox is one that um, you guys also have here in Colorado um, and in Kansas and, and Montana and a few other plain states. Um, again, they're a little bit of a sensitive species. They're a lot of times associated with prairie dog colonies um, and they're, they're a species of interest because their, their numbers can kind of teeter on that um, edge of, of needing um, or maybe requiring listing um, under the ESA. So, okay, we'll finally get to the species that I came here to talk about. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit first, um, just cover some general life history and ecology of wolverines. They're such a crazy animal. Uh, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the survey methods that we employ uh, to monitor them because they are kind of like an elusive, you know, they're, they're not numerous on the landscape. They're hard to see. Um, so we have to do some kind of tricky things in order to understand where they are. Uh, and then I'll, I'll share with you some of our survey results from, again, this is one of those, um, one of those surveys we do on a cycle. Uh, so I'll share with you the data that we collected in 2016 and 17, and then the data that we just got finished processing here from uh, 2021. Okay, any questions so far on any of that uh, agency? Mumbo jumbo. <laughs> so you kind of know where I'm coming from. Um, so a little bit on Wolverine life history. They're the largest, I have to qualify, they're the largest land mistelid. Um, so they're in the weasel family. There's a species of otter that is kind of enormous in South America that's a little bit bigger than them. But in, in North America, they're they're essentially the largest mistelid. Uh, females are smaller than males, so there's that sexual dimorphism. Um, males are a lot of times almost twice as big as females. Um, they have these big feet. Um, they have semi-retractable claws, so they can climb. They're, they're not fantastic at it, but they can get it done. Uh, and, and they have powerful jaws, and that has to do a lot with, uh, with their diet of eat a lot of carrion, honestly. Um, they can hunt for themselves, but, but they rely a lot on finding um, finding dead stuff and caching it. Um, and they have this nice chocolate coat. And a cool thing about them is they, they have a lot of variable markings. Um, so you'll see a lot of pictures. Um, the one in the, on the right side there, you can see these chest markings. They have um, like these lighter side markings commonly. Sometimes you'll find one that's almost all chocolate brown, but that side marking, a lot of people will call it an apron. Um, and you'll see various little white markings on feet. Um, and that chest pattern can vary or be almost non-existent. And we can use that in photographs to, to identify individuals, which is, which is kind of cool. As far as their distribution across the globe, they're, they're not um, confined to North America. They have a circumpolar distribution. Um, so a little bit confusing, and hopefully you can see with the coloring on the, on the left map that that's looking at the North Pole down. Um, and then in the uh, in the continental U.S. and, and Canada, 
the darker red is their current range and the lighter pink color is, is their estimated historic range. Um, and that got contracted mainly uh, because of over trapping, um, which doesn't happen in a lot of places in the continental US uh, at all anymore. Um, you'll find some states where they're still listed as a fur bearer species, but their seasons are currently closed as, as a bunch of states adjacent to Wyoming and Colorado try to work on managing and, and increasing their numbers. So, um, but they were essentially eliminated from the continental US in the 19, by the 1920s because of over trapping. Um, and they've since then been slowly kind of spreading back down into mountain ranges and high elevation habitats um, in the Rockies in the Western United States since then. So these are kind of the things that make them hard to see and hard to understand how many we have on the landscape. Uh, they're very solitary. They have huge home ranges. Um, and a lot of the things that they do happen at night, although you're gonna see a lot of daylight photos of them. A lot of that is in the winter months that they spend time out during the daytime uh, because the colder temperatures kind of, uh, they prefer that. But these are a boreal or an alpine forest species. They like the tree line before you, you know, run out of, run out of uh, conifers and end up in um, just scree and, um, and boulder fields uh, are commonly places that you'll find them, especially in the summer months. In the winter, once we get that snowpack that starts to cover things, you'll find them coming down in elevation, which you'll find we also take advantage of for these surveys. Um, and they require huge areas with not very much disturbance. So you can you can imagine with all of the different activities that happen, um, like along the Front Range in the Rockies, um, all the recreating and things like that, those disturbances can have an influence on whether you find wolverines will tolerate um, living in those spaces or not, um, but also like things like timber harvest, um, extraction type um, mine activities and things like that that happen in mountain ranges also have a negative influence on, um, on wolverine presence. They will eat anything. Uh, so they're, uh, they're truly a meso carnivore, which means they're, they're not just uh, a carnivore. They'll, they'll take advantage of every, everything they can they can eat that's edible. So um, when when it's available, they'll eat berry seeds, roots. Um, sorry to say they will definitely raid bird nests and eat eggs, uh, which are super nutritious. Um, they'll capture and ambush both small and large prey, but their preference is to scavenge on period. Uh, so they, the way they make it through the winter months is they will find things that have perished in the snow uh, and they will cache those things and hide them in the snow and go back and feed on, the, on those things until it's gone. Um, and you'll find that they move around. They, they'll have winter den sites, but they'll, if food is scarce in one place and they run out of chow, they'll pick up and, and go someplace else. Even if they have cubs, they'll pick them up and go with uh, and create a new den site looking for food in different places. So they're, they're nomadic um, and their ranges can be really, really big. Um, their mating season is in May and August, um, but um, just weird things about species in the weasel family, they, they have really strange reproductive ecology. So um, they have what's called delayed ovulation. They, and most, most things in the weasel family have this, they don't ovulate until they have copulated. So um, it's really hard for, um, our black and ferret recovery um, uh, captive rearing program because you can't just artificially inseminate those creatures. They have to actually copulate before you can before you can breed them. So it's it's this weird weird uh, like dance of getting that done in captivity. Uh, but that delayed implantation gives uh, gives them the opportunity to mate um, and then. Uh, and then ovulate. And then on top of that, they, that fertilized egg will not implant until later on when they're uh, like later on in the winter. So um, they can, it's not like they consciously time it, but their nutrition will kind of control when that implantation takes place. Um, their den sites are usually above 7,000 feet. Again, these are alpine critters. They might venture into lower elevations looking for food, but most of their, um, 
their pup rearing den sites are up higher and they'll do that under logs, boulders and just plain old like into the snow. Um, so again, that you'll see in blue, they cache food in snow, they need persistent snow for denning. So this is an important component of their, their life history. So this is a species that we have concerns about relative to climate change. If we're gonna lose some of that snowpack um, or the, the season that we have snowpack becomes contracted, um, we have concerns that wolverines are not, are not necessarily gonna be able to adapt to that. Kits are adorable. Uh, <laughs> They have one to four uh, born um, right now, essentially. Um, they emerge from dens in May. Um, they're dependent upon the female for a year. So they're kind of like bears where they learn a lot. There's a lot of parental care. Um, so there's a lot of investment in those kits um, by the mother. So for one year after that, she's not reproducing. Um, and they don't reach maturity to mate themselves until they're two or three years old. So very similar to like black bears. Um, but that slow reproductive rate is another thing that that impedes them, you know, their populations growing and expanding. It's a very slow process. So um, to gauge those trends over time, it takes a lot of those surveys over those five year periods to 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 um, gauge or detect any of those changes happening, whether it's in the positive or in the negative. Some population level threats. Um, the two points up there that are in white are kind of like old um, pre, like uh, pre the uh, pre 1920s and 30s when they started to stretch back into the the lower 48. The reason that they um, that their numbers were um, retracted and um, and they disappeared uh, in this part of North America was because again of unregulated trapping and they just had a bad rap overall. They're just not uh, a species that people found favorable or a varmint. Um, they were, you know, like getting into things and um, like attacking livestock and things like that. Um, those are not as big of a concern now. Uh, the stuff that's in the orange are the concerns that we have now. And, and I've mentioned some of those already. So all of those things related to climate change, um, expansion of human activity um, into higher elevation country for recreating, for logging, for mining, uh, all the roads and um, housing developments and things like that that fragment habitat. They like having a lot of continuous undisturbed habitat um, and all of those things kind of cut into that. So their management status, uh, they've been petitioned for listing as an endangered species uh, twice and in between lots and lots of litigation. Right now, they're currently under review. In fact, I just had to finish our contribution to that this week um, for a threatened status rather than endangered status, um, which is just a little bit lower level and, and not, as, um, not as intensive with um, legal limitations for, for land use um, for the public and, and for um, industry, but still helps recovered populations, um, but currently their, their listings, the previous attempts at listing them as endangered were found not warranted. And it's because we don't have a lot of information on them because they're so um, secluded, secretive, and there's just not many of them on the landscape even when they're doing well. Uh, we just didn't have a lot of data on them. So that issue with uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service not being able to um, justify them being uh, listed as endangered was is part of the impetus of of us realizing as land, as wildlife managers that we need this information so that we can use that to inform management of this species so that kind of created uh some movement um with with some of the wildlife agencies in the western united states um both federal and state folks so we formed a cooperative group to monitor wolverines across their range, rather than each individual state having their own idea of how to do things, everybody doing everything different and trying to compare data that's kind of apples to oranges. All of us, all the agency folks got together and collectively came up with a survey design that everyone did in unison with the same design, all the data, were contributed into one giant data set and analyzed together. And that gives us a range-wide 
piece of information that's much better than all of these kind of piecemeal bits um, with different people having different ideas of how it should be done. So um, the whole goal of this is to, to look at long-term population viability um, to support, uh, like identify what is suitable habitat, what, what are the things on the ground that indicate that this is good habitat for, for wolverines and what can we do to keep that, um, those, those things on the ground that way or expand them so that we can have um, wolverine populations expand into the areas where they used to exist and to manage wolverines as a protected species. Again, um, they're like not, not, not um, allowing trapping or any other um, recreational take of the species until, until we're comfortable with the population levels um, in the lower 48 being able to, um, to maintain or sustain that sort of harvest. So all of the states that you see up here and all the federal agencies um, are part of that collection. Um, there's a big organization called WAFWA, which is the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, which is a chunk of AFWA, which is the whole United States um, agencies. Uh, but uh, we, we work all collectively under WAFWA, um, and that is kind of how all of these agencies have organized and, um, and collaborated together. I should mention there's, there's at least three tribal agencies that are not listed up there that should be included, one being in Wyoming and uh, one being in Oregon, one being in uh, Washington that also participate. Um, but, but mainly it's the state wildlife agency. So CPW here, um, Wyoming Game and Fish Department, Utah, Oregon, um, and so on. So all of these folks have representatives on this group that, um, that work together. Go? Speedgo is our uh, our number cruncher. <laughs> so they're um, they're a company out of Montana. They're affiliated with University of Montana. They're biostatisticians um, that do the data analysis for us, and they have a background in wildlife. Um, so they uh, is essentially two guys that have a company that is kind of like an offshoot of stuff that they do um, for academia. So they're they're our number crunchers. Um, thank goodness, because <laughs> that's, that's big, it's a big undertaking. But good question, thank you. Uh, so, so all of us collectively are doing this, and, and the, the way, uh, the methods that we ended up agreeing upon was to use camera trap surveys. Um, again, these are species that are secretive, they don't like human presence, so you back out of the picture, you, I, I love trail cameras, they're so, um, they're so inexpensive and handy, and they collect so much great information that we would before never have the ability to collect. So again, it's multi-state cooperative monitoring, it's range-wide, and we've all agreed to collectively repeat this every five years. So the way this is done, and this is what this, I swear, this is the only part that's a little bit in the weeds. Um, we create a grid. Um, based on home range size. And these are actually a little bit smaller than, than Wolverine female home range sizes, which are smaller, male home range sizes are much bigger. But the, the goal is with each one of those little grids, like a square in that grid, it should be about the size of the home range of whatever species you're trying to collect information on. You put one camera in that grid uh, and, and we bait it. Uh, so we give wolverines a reason to show up in front of the camera. Um, so there's bait or lure in front of the camera, and then we can leave that over the entire winter and come back and collect um, the memory card, everything, and then go look through it, uh, which is a whole nother fun process. Um, and then to boot, we decided to add uh, gun brushes. I don't know how many of you um, are familiar with cleaning your firearms, but uh, gun brush is just a little metal bristly thing uh, that you shove down the bore of a, a rifle uh, to clean it out. It's also really handy at picking up hair. So um, you'll see in some of the pictures ahead, there's there's like a belt that we would put on the tree with bait above and the wolverine has to crawl over that belt and it has these stiff like bristle brushes basically sticking out of it that grab hair as they're trying to eat on the bait. And then we can use that for DNA analysis, which is which worked out pretty slick. Um, but this setup has been used for a lot of sort of um, elusive, secretive species um, like fishers, uh, 
Pine Martin, uh, Lynx, Bobcats, things like that. So you're just kind of adjusting your survey grid size, depending on the home range size that you estimate for that species, and then overlaying it with suitable habitat and, and then selecting sites from there. Um, the folks that get to go put those out and pick them up are hardcore individuals. <laughs> so this is all in the winter months um, so that we can take advantage of some, some of those lower elevation sites that they use in the winter. Um, also comes in very handy because some of the other species that would be attracted to those bait and lure smells uh, are hibernating. Um, so hopefully they're less likely to attack and destroy your site before Wolverine gets there. Um, so some of the cameras that were set um, had bait, which and in our case, we used um, um, roadkill, like basically chunks of roadkill deer. So like a quarter of the deer would get hung up in a tree. Um, our inaccessible sites that got left um, for the entire winter before we could have someone go back and collect them because of snowpack, um, got a lure dispenser, which has some really great smelling, skunky, stinky beaver, castor. It's great when it gets spilled in your work truck. Um, super. Uh, <laughs> um, those, those sites that got left long-term that we know the bait would get eaten before, uh, before they were visited again by our technicians, have this lure that comes out of a dispenser and grips onto a piece of bone repeatedly. It's almost like a like a little air freshener dispenser that lets something out every X number of hours. So, and then those camera images give us a picture. Is there a Wolverine that showed up at the site? Yes or no? Um, but we can collect other great things like the DNA off of hair samples and, and, and good info like that. Might as well take advantage of everything when you're gonna go through all of this effort to set these sites up. So this is a little bit of what it looks like. Um, this example is not a deer portion. That's a beaver, a skinned out beaver um, that I think Washington used. Um, whatever, it's edible and it smells good to a wolverine. So it gets tied to a tree. This is one of those lure dispensers here with a, just a piece of a beef marrow bone hanging underneath it. So that oily lure drips onto there and smells great. Um, these are the gun brushes I was talking about. And then it's literally just like um, corrugated um, plastic that they get um, attached to sticking out. It's, oops, it's hard to see, but that's that belt around the tree there. Lure is up here. This is a sponge, or excuse me, that's bait. This sponge up here has some stinky lure on it. It's actually not a Wolverine. That's a um, Pine Martin um, in that photo, but it kind of gives you a, a feel for how, how these get set up. And then a camera is attached to a tree facing it. And then, and then we back out and hope that somebody shows up. So here's some examples of results. Um, again, you can see these unique neck uh, marking patterns. This one has some white toes. This one has a whole white foot. Um, so you can see different individuals. Um, you can see them visiting different camera sites. So some of our visits were by one Wolverine at more than one camera, um, which is, Kind of cool and shows you how much um, area they cover, which is a lot, but um, but they will crawl up there any way they can to get at that in the middle of winter when there's very scarce options for other meals. So um, so it's really fun when you are going through thousands and thousands of pictures. And by the way, lots of birds are on the camera. There's so many, so many barks, nutcrackers, magpies, ravens all hanging out, um, picking away at that stuff. So um, when you get a Wolverine instead of a million magpies, it's like, yes, <laughs> sorry, magpies. Uh, this is what those bread cells look like. So this is from our first study. The gray, the kind of gray light colored uh, squares are all of the grids. The darker black ones are the ones that got selected to have a camera in them. And then the green ones are ones that had a Wolverine detection on them. So the first year that we did this, it was just uh, Wyoming, Idaho, Montana, Washington, that all were the first cooperative bunch to try this out. The light green ones are supplemental detections. That's like members of the public saying like, hey, I saw Wolverine. Um, if they can prove it with a track, a photo, video, whatever, um, then it becomes a confirmed observation and it, it goes on this map and it also gets contributed to the Fish and Wildlife Service data set. Um, but the dark greens are the ones where the cameras actually caught um, 
caught an image of a Wolverine on the camera. So in Wyoming, out of 51 cameras, we got six that have Wolverine, which doesn't sound like much, but when you know zero about Wolverine distribution in the state, it's pretty cool. Um, and, and we were pretty happy about it. It's lower, um, and it makes sense. I mean, we're down here. This is, remember their extent the, up, is still up here and, and they're trying to redistribute themselves back down mountain ranges in the Western United States. So it's not real surprising that we have lower densities down here compared to the mountain ranges up here in Idaho and Montana. But um, um, these percentages that you see up there, so 0.12, that's what we call an occupancy rate. And it's a naive occupancy rate that's uncorrected based on um, habitat. So, uh, and all of these grid cells are overlaid with what, um, what we calculated as being suitable habitat. So it's the right elevation, has the right habitat type, um, the right temperature ranges annually, things like that. Uh, but we we're just really thrilled to get this range-wide first look at where we have um, where we have some wolverines. And the fact that we were finding them all the way down here, this is the end of the Wind River Range. That is, um, I'm going to skip ahead. That is the southernmost female wolverine ever detected in North America since we started collecting any information on wolverines. So that was pretty cool. Um, and that got Utah and Colorado and Oregon interested, like, hey, maybe we should probably jump on and, and, and uh, participate in this study too. Um, as far as the genetic stuff from collecting hair from those gun brushes go, we got 19 samples that were ID'd as Wolverine. Um, and then four of those were good enough quality. Remember, these stay out in the cold for a long time. So sometimes they degrade and you can't get all of the information off of them that you would get from like a tissue sample. Um, but we're, we're just happy when we get anything, even ID to species. We were able to get two ID to as males and two ID to individual females. Um, and that's how we knew that that southernmost one was, was female. So pretty cool. Uh, so then we wait five years and we do it again. And this time, like I said, Utah participated, Colorado participated. Uh, California uh, in the Sierra Nevadas, sorry, I've forgotten, um, California and Oregon um, participated. And you can see some other little squares sprinkled around the other states that didn't get sampled. Um, the blue ones in this case are the ones that got cameras on them. Um, and you can see in Wyoming, we also added this, uh, I think there's three camera sites there that got selected in the, in the snowy range. Um, and then Colorado, only did um, sampling here. I think that's north of, is that the I-70 corridor that cuts across? Um, they just kind of dipped their toe in to test that before they put a full effort into the entire state. And I know your governor is very, very interested in reintroducing Wolverine and, and, uh, and none were detected in Colorado um, during this time period. That doesn't mean that they're not there. It just means that they didn't step in front of those cameras. So I don't want that, like no detection doesn't mean necessarily no Wolverines. It just means that we didn't, we didn't detect them. Um, so, and we have uh, incidental um, observations in Colorado, Utah, uh, even though they didn't have any positives on their cameras, there's observations from the public that confirm they're around. So, so we know they're there. Um, but it's like sites with the cameras, do you, so if it was a green square on that first one, did it automatically get a camera next year? We, next yeah, so all of the sites that we did in the first round are exactly the same as the second round, and then we added some more. Um, and the same is true for all the other states. So we, we kept that first random selection so that, again, we can compare apples to apples over time. If we start to redistribute that selection, it makes the statistical analysis harder. Um, and, and then it's harder to make inferences between survey years about what's happening. So we kind of, we did the random sample, we stick with it. It's also handier because the first time you go into those sites, you take notes like, this site is a pain in the butt and you have to bushwhack through and there's bears and like, maybe we shouldn't go to that site anymore. <laughs> it, gives, it gives the technicians in future years a little bit more information about what they're what they're doing and how how much effort it's going to take. 
Um, so yeah, we repeat the same grid cell sites. Um, so this last round, and this is just zoomed into Wyoming, of course, um, we had much higher um, detection rates. So remember the other detection rate the first time was 0.12. This time it's 0.29, uh, which is great. So it seems like Wyoming, and it's a little bit hard again to infer just between two survey years. So like once we get another and another five years out and another five years out, that'll give us some better long-term info, but we're getting more and more. Um, we had 10 new detection sites compared to last time. Um, just to give you a feeling of how many images myself and technicians have to wade through and look at and lay eyes on, uh, there were almost 5,000 out of 250 to 300,000 total images mm -hmm. that had Wolverines in them. Those other ones had a lot of magpies <laughs> in them. <laughs> but, uh, but it's worth it. I mean, it's a great data set. Uh, and again, it gets contributed to this large whole west-wide uh, set of data. Um, so we still didn't have any detections um, the first year or this last time um, out here in the Bighorn Mountains. And, and we did, oops, we did add some down here in the snowy range. Didn't have any detections. That doesn't mean they're not there. Um, but we'll, we'll continue to survey those sites and see if we get any positives. Um, again, this is kind of hard to see. Um, the, there's some additional dots out there that are blue. Those are the added public sightings that were confirmed. Um, there's a lot of activity in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem because of the parks. So we get a lot of people that lay eyes on wolverines. And luckily, a lot of them are wildlife photographers and send really awesome pictures, <laughs> um, like easy to confirm. So those get added, those get contributed to the whole data set. Um, and, and that contributes to those determinations of, does this species warrant listing as threatened, endangered? This data set backs that up. And then the genetic results from this last time, they're not done yet, um, but we have more samples that have been already ID'd to species as wolverine. So last time we had 19, this time we have almost 40, and we're just waiting for the genetics lab in Montana uh, to come back with their further analysis to tell us uh, males, females, like down to individuals, who was at what camera and um, you know where they left those hair samples. And we can also use that and cross-reference it with some of those markings and determine who's who from their markings and their genetics, which will be great for future surveys. All right, here comes the fun. Please work. Please, please, please. This is what some of these camera images look like. Yeah. I love the magpie just waiting, <laughs> waiting for snacks. The wolverine does not like, you'll see him get chased after a while. So the cameras take three pictures, like a burst of three pictures, and this is a whole bunch of them strung together. Can I ask about the paint? Yeah. How long does that last? <laughs> it depends on who gets there first. <laughs> um, it gets replaced at the accessible sites. It gets replaced once a month if we can get in because of the weather. It just kind of depends. Um, they, it gets put out usually before the snow flies and before we have some uh, hibernation. So we did have grizzlies destroy some of these, um, which is also entertaining to watch. But yeah, the, it's like, I love the like Mission Impossible. <laughs> Um, if you're paying attention, there's these are three different wolverines, uh, which is also pretty incredible. They're supposed to be a very solitary animal. Um, and one of these individuals just got caught this weekend and had a collar put on it because we had so much activity at this site. Um, one of my colleagues put a trap out uh, this year and, and caught one of them. I think it's this one. So there's actually three. So the first one had, I, I can replay it again after we're done, but the first one had white paws, very distinct white paws. The other two, I, I had to quit because there's hundreds and hundreds of pictures. Um, the second one is kind of like a traditional colored um, individual without any real markings on its feet. And then this third one, if you pay attention, if I run it again, it might be kind of hard to see in here. It has two really distinct white markings on its shoulders um, that, that you can see that's different from the other one. So my guess is that one of those 
is a female and the other two are her offspring. That's the only reason I think that they would tolerate each other and hang out with one another. There's a timestamp on here too. You just can't see it because of the menu at the top, but um, the first one comes in and then there's like an hour gap and then the second one comes in and the third one comes in right after it. So I think those last two are probably yearlings. And the first one that got dibs um, eating the bait was probably mom, but we'll see when we get DNA back um, if, if I'm correct or not. But it's just really fun to look through those pictures once you wade through all of the other ones. So we did, like I said, we get other visitors, which are always fun to see on uh, when you're sorting through thousands and thousands of images. So we got a red fox who's not even, doesn't even care about the bait. It's already got a snowshoe hair in its mouth. Um, the second picture is a black bear. Grizzly bear would not be able to make it up the tree. Um, and then you'll see a pine marten and a mountain lion easily climbing up the tree. Um, these are like great to see, but they eat the bait. So um, it can have an influence on if somebody shows up or not. Um, we do also have, um, that second picture doesn't even have bait. This is one of our dispenser sites. So that's that lure dispenser, and this is just a bare bone. So that bear is just interested in the smell and that's it. He didn't get a food reward, sorry. Uh, but they, the bears do a number on those gun brushes. They almost always rip them, rip them down and make them ineffective. Um, yes, like that one <laughs> with the collar, uh, which is also cool to see someone else's study animal. Uh, showed up. Uh, they're not very good at getting up the tree, but um, but coyotes can, if they want something pretty bad, can get up there. Uh, the grizzly bears on the right, um, there's got to be like 200 pictures in that series with those two yearlings being small enough to actually climb the tree. The sow could not get up there, but the two uh, it was like watching a cartoon because like mm -hmm. one would get frustrated and like take it out on the other one. And <laughs> it's just like, painting. I know I was supposed to be collecting useful data, but this is just fun. Uh, and it's a nice break from uh, a, like a lot of uh, more boring pictures. And then these maniacs are the four technicians that we had working on on that project. They they dealt with so much cold and so much snow. They they skied in, they snow machined in, they got stuck. Um, they worked their butts off. So uh, it was great like going through those pictures after they're done uh, and gone and onto new jobs and get to see them like goofing off in front of the camera. It was really nice to see. They they worked really hard and did a great job. What is that bait secured with that doesn't get ripped out? Um, it's like a like a metal cable, um, and then it's screwed into the tree. Um, the bears will yank it down a lot of times. Might be like a remnant piece of a femur left out there, but um, they'll they're about the only ones that are strong enough to pull it entirely down. Um, there's images of wolverines like hanging from it by their jaws, like a pit bull, you know, just. Trying to trying to pull it down, but um, it's secured in there with like a like a big metal screw. Yeah. Uh, so awesome data set um, and pretty cool to see, especially it's it's such a hands off, uninvasive kind of a study design. It's it's really neat to get those results and not disrupt the species that doesn't like human disturbance. So um, those changes in occupancy will continue to monitor those over time, um, and it'll. It'll keep giving us information about suitable habitat. It'll give us information about um, effects of climate change as we get more and more data. And again, that helps direct our future research on wolverines and helps inform those management and listing decisions that are important um, for the species on a range-wide scale. So, and that's it. Any questions? So what's the estimated population of Wyoming? Um, I don't think we're going to do like a like a population estimate just by state. It'll be range. Um, it's more of a the way that we do it for such a solitary species is more of a density estimate instead of just a guess at numbers. I would have to look up what it was the last time this this data set, this most recent one, is still in the like, analysis phase. We had to wait. Uh, Washington had some trouble with snow getting in and retrieving some of their sites. So we had to wait for 
all of that data to be processed. So it's it's a little behind, but I think that final report is supposed to be out in November. Um, there's such a low density species though. We certainly have lower densities here than in Canada, uh, where they're actively, they're, they're fur bearer species that get trapped all the time. The, our best genetic information comes from trappers from like British Columbia um, and other places up, um, towards Alaska where, where trappers are allowed to take them. Um, there's also a lot of great genetic work in uh, like Banff, um, Calgary area, where again, you have these big continuous chunks of undisturbed habitat. Um, and you have a huge Canadian highway that crosses, bisects that country. There's an actual detectable genetic difference because they won't, they don't like that highway, they won't cross it. There's not a lot of genetic mixing and you can actually see it in the beat when they're DNA analysis. Yeah, yeah, it's really neat stuff. I saw a hand over here somewhere. I was going to ask a question about Canada and the results in Canada. Sure. Um, I'll do my best. All right. Um, Steve, and it's a very low uh, area. Mm -hmm. What's it like in Canada? It's a little higher density there because you have larger tracts of undisturbed habit, suitable habitat there. Um, it's high enough that that trapping is allowed in those provinces um, where there's where there's good population, and it doesn't seem to have a negative impact on them. I don't imagine that they get a lot of folks that focus on harvesting. Uh, they're mostly trying to catch other species that have a high dollar amount associated with pelts um, for like fur trade for sale. Um, they get them as bycatch and sell them kind of secondarily. And as much as I am not a huge fan of trapping, it's great how much those trappers participate in contributing those DNA samples. They're more than happy to. Um, like a lot of our researchers in Canada will go to, and Montana as well, will go to um, fur trading events where people buy and sell all of these pelts and approach um, trappers and ask for that stuff and they gladly, most of them gladly hand it out. That is a really important piece of information that we would have to put tons of effort in to collect ourselves. So it's really, as much as I, like I said, as much as I don't like trapping, Personally, it's great that they are willing to help us out with um, with giving us. They could say no. They say, you know, it's choice, and they they choose to help. So I know what we're the what value of a wolverine pelt, I would not know. Uh, I know, like bobcats range from. Aaron's gonna be better at this than me. My husband right there, like two hundred to up, upwards of six hundred per animal, depending on the year, the scarcity of the of the animal. And the modeling, like the coloration, has different levels of desirability. Um, I don't know that wolverines, at least in North America, are, are valued. The, most of the pelts, as far as I'm aware, go to Chinese markets or Russian markets, Asian markets. Um, there's not a huge demand for those things. in, So they get traded across, across the world. Yeah. Since you're talking about um, trapping, is yeah. it true that the <laughs> fur has a unique question? Right? Is it true that the fur has a unique quality of not accumulating ice from your breath? I've heard that they oh. blind foot. I'm not positive on that. That's a great question. Um, I know they they have like a, a thick undercoat that's like a different consistency. They they do best in in snow. Like that is their ideal climate. Um, and most of the photography I've seen of them in winter, they don't have stuff stuck to them. Um, they're, they've got like that nice sheen to them, but they don't, they're not like a beaver that has caster that, you know, like that they, that they, um, that gives them like that sheen. But, um, I would, again, they're such a hard animal to lay hands on. It's, so, it happens so infrequently. Um, I'm not sure that. I have the answer for that. I could find it out for you from some of the people that do more um, capturing and radio collaring of individuals in Canada. Yeah. And we do have, that's another one that we've just started partnering more with Canadian provinces and that whole massive group to spend that sample uh, into, into Canada and share data that way too. Yeah. Another answer here. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> so I know you've only done the two data sets, so it's not kind of difficult to still assume that the statistic. Yeah, over those two, but obviously it's like yeah. I'm looking at it right between the, the two. I guess my question is what other variables are being looked at? For example, something simple like snow Yeah. You guys are you analyzing all of that in relation to the data. We can yes. get, yeah. So so um your brother loves this term covariate. It's like a <laughs> it's a statistic, it's just like like these these other variables that you can model, like you can introduce them into a, a, a computer model with the data set that you have and see if there's relationships, positive or negative relationships with different things. There's landscape scale data sets on snowpack, um, temperature ranges of, of like from temperature weather stations distributed. Because this is such a huge data set, it's not just Wyoming, it's, it's the entire inner mountain west. There's all sorts of landscape scale um, like vegetation cover type, um, like satellite imagery um, derived um, sets of, of like GIS data that are incorporated into some of the analyses to see. And you can dump any number of those into a model and just run it and, and it'll spit out information that'll let you know if there's a relationship there or not, and if it's a strong or a weak relationship, and then you can go from there. I don't think that they adapt it, but I keep on the camera truck. So I noticed that we're like here mm -hmm. together. You just have to become it only as picture. You even yeah, we those are just pictures in bursts. Um, if you take video, it'll use up the the camera memory chip too fast. So um, and I've done that for other studies. So it takes a little burst every time something moves in front of it, it'll take a burst of three pictures. That takes up a lot less space on a memory card than video that keeps running and running. So I just took a whole series of those little bursts and strung them together to show you that kind of in a video mode. Um, we could do that, but we'd have to check, <clears throat> excuse me, we have to check the camera all the time and swap um, memory cards out of it because it would be constantly filling it up. So you had one question online yes. um, in the chat box, which asks about whether or not you have colleagues working um, regarding Pine Martins in Wyoming, Colorado. And I have a follow-up question with that. Mm -hmm. um, does all the data get recorded for every species? We um, we haven't talked. So this, this committee of agencies that's cooperating on this for wolverines, we also cooperate on other species. So the next one that we'll be working on this winter instead of wolverines will be lynx. Um, it's uh, because they're different species with different home range sizes, we have to redo that distribution of all those little squares. They're different sizes for different species. But the one thing that is a huge like long-term goal for that group is to do nested surveys. So those grids, those little squares that are supposed to represent a home range for different species can be nested within each other. And then you can put one camera out and collect and analyze data for multiple species with one effort. So that would apply to Pine Martin um, and potentially lynx. Um, we certainly use the data that we get on those other species um, by recording it in our statewide observation database. And that gives us some more range info. It's not technically like an occupancy analysis like this because the because the camera distribution was set specifically for this species, but we can still use that location data to inform other things. Yeah, if anyone else online has a question, uh, feel free to put it in the chat or you can jump in right now. <clears throat> Losing my voice. Young disperse, do they disperse at one um, with big wide open spaces to get? I it's not possible to follow the mountains to get to other mountains. There, so from what we've seen, it's a little bit of each uh, because there's only so many home ranges that can kind of be contained in some of those areas with good wolverine habitat. You will get some of those young 
that have to disperse across unsuitable, low elevation, open country, whatever, habitats, in search of new places to establish themselves. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so we get like some of those incidental observations are like, boom, like out here, out there. And when you get those calls from someone like, hey, I saw a wolverine out in the sagebrush and, you know, I'm like, oh. And then you get a picture and like, yep, that's a like, I like as much as it sounds suspicious, it, I, it can certainly happen. It's not common, but uh, for someone to actually witness it. Um, but we have camper uh, collar data that shows those dispersals too. Um, this one that we just put a collar on last week, we don't have a whole lot of information on yet, um, but it was an adult female um, and like an older female. So she probably will stay within her home range. But Utah sort of opportunistically a year ago had the, uh, the chance to put a collar on a wolverine that was getting into domestic sheep. So they trapped it and had a collar that was the right size and put it on. Um, You'll notice they don't really have a neck <laughs> to speak of. <laughs> and they're a denning species, so they're really hard to collar with, with a device that wasn't specifically made for wolverines. Um, that collar stayed on that animal, I think, for a couple of months before it somehow warmed its way out of it. But uh, that was in, is that the Uwinas or the Wasatches that go horizontal? You went those, thank you. Um, they trapped it there. It went all the way west, basically into that, like around the corner of Utah in that northeast corner. It came into the Wyoming Range in Wyoming and then spit back out onto the Utah side of that border there um, before it shed that collar. So that one individual covered all that country in just two months. Um, so they they can in some there's a, like a lot of carnivore and mesocarnivore species. Especially when they're young and they don't have their own home range, they just go on like a walkabout until they find something. And we, we spot them in the various places. How many pollen animals are there? Um, currently uh, in Wyoming, just that one, we just wanted to kind of test it out and see. We'll see if this one stays on better than the Utah collar. Um, it is uh, one made by a Canadian company that specifically was designed for a Canadian Wolverine collar study. That's the last study that I know of was a Canadian study where, where researchers actively captured and colored them to look at home range size and habitat use. And that's the information that we use then to come up with these maps of where we're gonna survey for them by looking at that, the way they use habitats in those places, then you just kind of apply it to a larger, um, a larger landscape. None of the other states are colored? Nope, not currently. It's really expensive. Uh, it's and it's really labor intensive. So um, this camera trapping work is hand like I really like the hands off part of it, where you still get great information without having to deal with the stress of of trapping an animal in the snow in the cold that may or may not have young uh, that are dependent on it at that time of year. Uh, there's just like a lot of things that you can't control for um, that you're kind of taking risks some of those studies. And the data is worth it in some cases, but you really have to, I feel like you have to know what questions you're asking to justify doing that to all of those animals and make them carry that equipment around on them for a year, two years, three years. So, yeah. And you mentioned that in Canada, you've got two different species. You mentioned in Canada, you have two species <laughs> on North and South Road. <laughs> Highway, mm -hmm. the Trans Can Highway. Yeah. What about I eighty and I seventy? Would that effectively block propagation it, of the species? It could. It certainly could. Um, so the genetic data that we do have for the lower forty eight from that first um, study, we have a geneticist that did that Canadian research um, on either side of the Trans Canada Highway. They're the same species. They're just genetically um, from from one another at the population scale. Um, but um, it, it certainly would be possible down here. But what we have found so far is that we have, because we're at the southern edge of the range, there's not a lot of genetic mixing to be had. There's just not a lot of individuals to, you know, for their genes to flow between one another. So we have low genetic variability in the individuals that we got your samples from already, um, which might not necessarily be the worst thing. But I know that 
uh, like right now, Colorado is very aggressively looking at translocating, like capturing live wolverine and releasing them, similar to the wolf project. Um, and I know the governor is very, very interested. Um, they're trying to decide what population is best to get those individuals from. Is it the ones from Canada that have a little bit more genetic diversity? Or is it the ones here closer to the same habitat type that have the genes that have adapted to these southern ranges? Does that make more sense? Or do you get some of each and kind of let mating and mixing kind of sort that out? So, um, and some of that might be decided for you if you have places where you don't have enough wolverines to pick from, or you have an agency that's like, no, I don't, I don't think you're gonna take any of our. But it's a whole bunch of things to consider for a project like that. Like if you're gonna want them to succeed on the ground and have the the genes to back up like being able to tolerate new habitat types and sources and all of those things. <laughs> this is not a question I might get. Is it common that they hunt domestic animals? Um, every now and then, um, we'll have issues with livestock depredation. Um, there was one case that I know of last year in Wyoming. Um, again, it depends on it, it depends a little bit on who's running their sheep at what elevation. Um, and um, I don't know that they would. I, I don't put, they're like little Tasmanian devils. They're, I mean, I, I bet if they're hungry enough, they would try to take down like a domestic cow or a calf. Sheep are easier. <laughs> um, but I, I think a lot of the ones that do that are those young, like that have their new dispersers, they're naive, they're not the best at hunting and feeding themselves yet. And here's some easy techniques. Um, it doesn't happen as frequently. Some of our other big predator species, but every now and then we will certainly get one that gets into and causes trouble with livestock. Yeah. The requirement for persistence of snow sounds similar to lynx. Yes. Is there an overlap and did it compete for prey? Um, certainly. Yeah. For those smaller, you know, lynx, I think I always associate with snowshoe hair pretty tightly as a main food source. I mean, not their only food source, but, but they're pretty pretty tightly linked to one another. Wolverines are more of a generalist, I would say, like, it's like they'll eat anything. Um, so I'm sure there's overlap there in, in competition for prey. And they're both, like you said, snow adapted species. But a wolverine is fast enough to catch them here? Uh, they're like an ambush predator. So um, because they winter in some of those alpine habitats where there's some cover, I think that's probably their main tactic. I wouldn't say that they're a speedy animal. I'd say they would have to essentially wait for something to be close enough to like reach out and pounce on it, which is why they they rely almost, uh, I shouldn't say exclusively, but they lean pretty heavy on carrion. They wait for big animals to die of winter starvation or succumb to the elements. And then they have a lot of food in one big animal for a while. Sure. And they'll travel and smell that quite a ways. Colorado tried to introduce Colorado tried to introduce lynx. Yes. And it was a disaster. We inherited some of your lynx. Yeah. So yeah. Um, those were collared so that they could see where they went. Um, and some of them ended up in Wyoming for a little while. Um, like I said, we're about to do the same thing um, and instead look for lynx on the cameras. Um, and we'll use different attractants. Um, Cats are cats. They like shiny stuff. Like you literally hang a little, it's a compact disc on like a piece of fishing line so that it twirls and catches light. That will attract every kind of cat, including including lynx. So, uh, so like, yeah, what's that? A compact disc. <laughs> now I'll see myself on that one. <laughs> So we have time for one more question. If there's one question. <laughs> You're not allowed. <laughs> what predators do wolves have? Um, wolves will definitely be an issue. I would say. Um, like I said, in the winter time, they don't have a lot of. There's not 
species that can deal with that snow and move across the snow uh, and stay on top other than a lynx, which is, they're probably about, they're pretty close to the same size. Um, I don't think that those two would tangle with one another. Um, I have not seen any records. Again, they're so scarce. So like someone witnessing something actually happening where one species preys on another is pretty, pretty rare. Maybe a grizzly, you know, like if they had, but I'm envisioning like fighting over the same piece of food. Like there's a big dead elk, everybody wants a piece. Um, and like that becoming an issue more than like, I see, a, I'm a grizzly bear and I see a wolverine and that looks delicious is probably not something that happens frequently. I think it's more like competition for, for the same shared food resource when it's scarce, you know. They got big teeth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they don't that's right. And, and I swear everything in the weasel family might be like a certain size, but their attitude is like five times bigger. Yeah. <laughs> you were in Jasper, yeah. um, up in Canada. Mm -hmm. One of the rangers there, because there are wolverines up there, he actually saw a wolverine and a grizzly and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are so they have uh yeah, they have a lot of guts. Um they and I mean like I said, you'll see it in other other things in the weasel family. They they don't they're like little man syndrome, except for they're not really that little, but um they have got a lot of attitude considering their size. So that that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> the bear probably doesn't yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Cool. Well, thank well, you. I just want to say that this was a win-win for me today because I got to spend time with family. Heather and Erin drove down from Casper just for this presentation. So it was a win for me and for all of us and those online. So thank you for those um, joining us via Zoom. Heather, this was amazing. Thank, so, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>